Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm sitting here with my beloved father, Christo Visa, who is not only the most intelligent person that I have the privilege of knowing, but also one of the wisest. So today I want to share some of his biggest life lessons with all of you watching at home. Dad, what three golden rules of life would you like your children to live by and remember one day? I was forewarned that that question may come. For me, uh, the first lesson, and we all should know it because the Bible spells it out very clearly, that the greatest of all things in life is love. If you can lead a life of love with all that that implies, then you are on the right course. Now, I have to confess, like most people, that I have not always lived up to that standard, but it is a lodestar for me in my life to know that, as the Bible says, of all things, love is the greatest. One of your favorite songs is Love Changes Everything. Changes Everything. Absolutely. I mean, it, it cannot be articulated better than that song. Love Changes Everything. What is the second life lesson that comes to mind that you want your children to remember? You must always be your own person. Yes. You must decide for yourself what you want to do, what you want to achieve, what you are prepared to sacrifice for that. And as I often told you when you were a little girl, uh, when people say to you, but Claire, you know, you've got it very easy because your dad uh, is perceived to be successful, then just remember that I don't write your exams. I don't run your races. I don't play your piano. You've got to do that for yourself so that you can know that as an individual, you have your own qualities and you are really, at the end of the day, your own person. Can I ask you on that note, is it hard for you that your children haven't become as involved in your businesses as no. you might have expected? No, never. I mean, it never bothered me. I mean, my children must make their own lives and achieve their own goals uh, and derive their happiness from what they do. There's no obligation on them to try and, you know, build a dynasty. I always said I particularly don't want that. Why? No, because I think it places an obligation on the child that he or she wouldn't necessarily have wanted. Again, it's somebody else determining your life for you. Comes back to my point, that you must be your own person. What is the third lesson that you want your children to live by? It would be my old theme of count your blessings. Be positive and enjoy life for what it is. We spoke about this in the video on your biggest business lessons, which by the way, everyone, I will link up here. But in terms of shock, disappointment, and setbacks that you've experienced yeah. in life on a personal level, yeah. I mean, I know that it often overlaps with business, but what is your biggest advice for dealing with that? Well, I think I've covered that by saying, you know, count your blessings, understand that life has ups and downs, and learn to deal with it. I mean, one thing that I observed with you after the whole Steinhoff debacle was how you just kept on going. You went for your lunches at Absolutely. Willoughby's on yeah. Saturdays. You yeah. enjoyed your time in the Kalahari. You never yeah. fell into a deep, dark hole yeah. that I think a lot of other people would have. And a lot of people might have become angry or bitter. So that is my next question. What is your way of avoiding falling into the trap of bitterness and anger and resentment and what role does that play in your life? Well, when that, when that debacle happened, uh, I debated with myself and I said, how am I going to get through this crisis? And I took the following three decisions. Number one, I do not mourn the loss of money. 
I will mourn the loss of people that I love, but not money, because money comes and goes. And in any event, when you depart this earth, you go out as you came into it. So money, never mourn the loss of money. Second one, I count my blessings because, you know, it could have been much worse. And thirdly, you don't become a bitter person because people have their own problems. They don't want to be exposed to your bitterness. Uh, it doesn't interest them. And I remember I had a friend who once told me, you must always remember, if you hate, hate owns you. The person you hate, he or she feels nothing. You're in a prison. But it chews you up. So hate owns you. They say being angry at someone or hating someone is like drinking poison and expecting them to die. Them to die. That's exactly right. That's a very clever way of doing it. Because they feel nothing. I mean, do you think the fraudsters in Steinhoff give a damn about what I or thousands of other people have suffered? How we feel about it. They, they don't give a hoot about it. But it can destroy your life, destroy your relationships. And uh, that's just a negative way of dealing with it. And that's adding insult to injury. Insult to injury. Dad, what do you think growing up in a small town like Uppington taught you? And what value did it add to your life and the man that you are today? That's an easy question to answer. It was the sort of place where people did care for each other. They, they shared sorrows and joy uh, as a community. And it was a tough part of the world. Droughts and floods were commonplace and people had to learn to deal with adversity and uh, hard working. Uh, what people. is the life lesson that growing up in Uppington taught you? There are many, but one life lesson is that, you know, you have to be or it's good to be part of a community that cares and you've got to care back. What makes you a good friend? Well, again, your grandmother had a saying, to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. That's the simple rule. If you are a friend, you will have a friend. What do you think that does to your quality of life? Well, it enhances it tremendously. I mean, there was an old story. I mean, it's been told about many places, but uh, that my parents often quoted. Uppington was the kind of place that if you arrive there from elsewhere, you would cry. But after a few years, if you had to leave Uppington, you would cry again. How do you cope in life, in business as well, with being criticized, often unfairly so? Yeah. Well, I suppose, uh, particularly with some of the criticism where people are talking about things that they have no clue as to what they're talking about. They have no knowledge or understanding. I'm afraid I do have a bit of an arrogant reaction to it. But it must irritate you. Yeah, it does irritate me a bit. But I mean, I don't allow it to, uh, to make me sleep less at night because I see it for what it is and I take it from whence it comes. And how do you deal with schadenfreude? I ignore it I, because I think it, it, a person who uh, suffers from schadenfreude uh, is a very small human being and you should really not pay any heed to it at all. Just ignore it and deal with it with the disrespect that it warrants. You know, it's like water off a duck's back. They always say that your first impression is a lasting one. Yeah. What do people do or can people do or have people done in your life to make an excellent first impression? Look people in the eye, first of all. Try and establish 
uh, a humorous, uh, humorous, uh, humorous relationship. I love people uh, who can poke fun at themselves and quickly do it. They, they always make a good impression on me. I, I'm not impressed by people who try to tell you in the first five minutes how clever they are or how rich they are or who are all the people they know. Uh, that is definitely a kiss of death. No, kiss of death. Kiss of death. Let's talk about uncertainty, especially in the light of COVID, the pandemic, um, everything that's going on with the world, all the controversy about conspiracy theories and about vaccine or no vaccine. There's just so much uncertainty. What is your lesson for dealing with uncertainty? You understand that life is not a bed of roses and you have to deal with the bad things and with the good things. There's a lesson that Oma Kurti taught you that you always um, relay yeah. in Dutch. Well, she had this Dutch saying that in Dutch goes this way, de mens leid dikwils meest voor die leiden dien hy vrees die nooit kom op te dagen en so heeft hij meer te dragen als wat God hem te dragen geeft. In English it is people often suffer most from the things that they fear will happen that never happened and consequently they bear a heavier burden than God ever intended for them to bear. And that is such a basic truth. You look around you, how people, uh, you know, are anxious and anguish about something that they fear may happen. And it never happens. But in the meantime, it screws up their life. One of my examples, and I, I'm not, you know, casting stones at people, but people who are always living in fear that South Africa will turn into a catastrophe. There will be a revolution and things will be destroyed and uh, our lives will be ruined. And I mean, I'm now 80 years old. I first took note of these fears and concerns 60 years ago when people were leaving the country or always anxious. And here I am 60 years later. So the lesson is do not concern yourself with tomorrow because today has got its own problems. No, I think one has to think about tomorrow. Uh, you can't ignore it. You've got to try to plan for it and that things may go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, no, I, I don't think that's my approach. So what is the My lesson? approach is, you know, this constant gnawing fear of what may happen. It's just the positive thinking thing again. We all know it may happen. I mean, a meteorite can strike the earth tomorrow and wipe out all life. That's a fact. But must you now constantly fret about that? and it not enjoy what life has given you to enjoy, whether it's friendship or family or grandchildren. Uh, what's the point in sitting here fretting about, yeah, but there can be a tsunami tomorrow. It can wipe Cape Town out. I just don't get it. But, uh, and that was Oma Kuti's lesson in that little Dutch saying, that you take upon yourself an almost unbearable burden by worrying about things that may never happen. Instead, you should just enjoy what you have. Dad, there are many people out there who are constantly chasing their dreams. The next big house, the next fancy car, thinking one day when they have that, they will be happy. Where does true happiness actually come from? True happiness is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. That's true happiness. I mean, 
We are all aware of so many people who have fame and fortune and glamorous lives that are desperately unhappy people. Desperately unhappy. You know, you can, the old thing is they say that uh, money can't buy happiness, which is a great truth. But on the other hand, it is easier to be a little bit unhappy and riding in a Mercedes rather than on a bicycle. That's also a truth. What role does relationships play in happiness? A huge role, indispensable role. I, I can't understand people, uh, but there are people who are uh, at their happiest when they are totally alone and uh, leading a solitary life. For me, it's just unimaginable. Look, sorry, Vak. It's all. Yes, Rimpi. So I want to put... Yeah, I'm actually going to do... Ek kom nou nou denkie, ek miskien kom sisterkie ook saam. Ok, ons gaan, ek gaan nou nou vertrek in 5 minuut. Ok. Ja, nee, ek sal bestel as ek daar kom denkie, want anders dan word het droog nie. Bye bye. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the other video I did with my dad, Christo Visa, on his best business advice. I'll link it down below and put it up here on the screen. Thank you guys.